So, you've got a continuous stream of water falling through a vertical distance of 100 meters. Assume no thermal energy is transferred to the surroundings. Specific heat capacity of water is 4,200. What is the temperature difference of the water between the top and the bottom? So essentially, the GP is going to be turned into kinetic energy, which is essentially going to be increasing the temperature. So if we figure out the change in GP, we can work out the thermal energy supplied to the water, and then we can equate that to mc delta t, rearrange it, plug the numbers in, and we get the temperature change of 0.23 Kelvin, which is option B. Okay, so a student measures the power of a microwave oven. We've got 200 grams of water at 23 degrees centigrade, and we heat it on full power for one minute. Then it removes it, temperature is now 79 degrees. Civic heat capacity is still 4,200. What is the rate at which thermal energy is gained by the water? So again, we're going to be using Q equals mc delta t, but in the place of Q, I'm gonna put power times time. We want the rate of thermal energy, so we want the power. So we rearrange it, plug the numbers in, and we end up with the power. So it's gonna be option A. The composition of carbon dioxide is uh, one atom of carbon, two atoms of oxygen. What is the number of molecules of CO2 in 2.2 kilograms of the gas? So what we're going to do is first calculate the number of moles using the molecular mass divided. Uh, so we've got the total mass divided by the molecular mass. There are two oxygen atoms, so we have to have 2 times 16. So we can figure out there are 50 moles. And once we know the number of moles, we can multiply by Avogadro's constant and we can get the number of molecules, which is option C. What is the total internal energy of 2.4 moles of an ideal gas, which has a temperature of 15 degrees centigrade? So, first, we're going to be using this equation here. We could use 3 over 2 nKT if we wanted to, but it's easier to do it this way. Um, so, we know the number of moles, we know the molar gas constant, we can calculate the temperature in Kelvin, giving us the internal energy option D. So Chiron is a moon of Pluto and has the mass equal to one ninth of that of Pluto. The distance between the centre of Pluto and the centre of Chiron is D. X is the point where the resultant gravitational field due to Pluto and Chiron is zero. What is the distance of X from the centre of Pluto? So we know their two field strengths are equal. So X is the distance from Pluto. So D minus X is the distance from Chiron. And we know the mass of Chiron is the mass of Pluto divided by nine. So I've put capital M over nine into the equation. Uh, we can cancel the GMs from both sides. Uh, we can mod flip both sides over. And then you should notice at this stage, all the numbers are square numbers. So we can square root everything rearrange and solve for x which is option c and with questions where we have field strengths equal to each other they very often involve square numbers so they give you an easy way to get to the solution okay the distance between the sun and mars varies from 2.1 times 10 to the 11 to 2.5 times 10 to the 11 meters when mars is close to the sun the force of gravitational attraction is f what is the force when they are furthest apart so um, I've made expressions for uh, the force at the minimum distance and the maximum distance. And because the distance is bigger, we'd expect the force to be slightly smaller. So then what I've done is I've taken expression two and divided it by expression one. And then we can, the G's, M's and M's will cancel out. And then we can plug our numbers in and we end up with option A. So a satellite X of mass M is in a concentric circular orbit of radius R about a planet of mass M. What is the kinetic energy? So if it's in a circular motion, we can equate Newton's law of gravitation with a centripetal, acceler uh, centripetal force. Um, we can then cancel some R's. We can then divide both sides by two, and we've got an expression for kinetic energy, which is clearly option A. So two parallel metal plates of separation A carry a char equal and opposite charges. Which graph best represents the electric field strength and how it varies with distance? Well, this is clearly a uniform field, so the field strength is going to be constant throughout. 
particle of mass m and charge q is accelerated through a potential difference v over a distance d. What is the average acceleration of the particle? So uh, what we can do is the work done by the potential difference will be the charge times the potential difference. Uh, force is work done divided by distance. So I've divided both sides by distance. Acceleration would be divided by mass. So we ended up with option A again. An electron moves through a distance of 0.1 meters parallel to the field lines of a uniform electric field of strength 2 kilonewtons per coulomb. What is the work done? Well, work done is force times distance. Force is field strength times charge. So the work done is charge times field strength times distance. Plug the numbers in and we end up with option C. Parallel plate capacitor is fully charged and then disconnected from the power supply. A dielectric is then inserted between the plates, which row correctly identifies the charge on the plates and the electric field strength between the plates. So uh, the equations I'm going to be using to explain this are these ones. So normally the, the relative permeability is one if there's no dielectric. If we put a dielectric in, it becomes greater than one. So what we've done is we've increased the capacitance of our capacitor. And if we increase the capacitance, uh, but we've still got the same number of charges on it because it's disconnected, that means the potential difference has to decrease. And if the potential difference decreases, the field strength decreases. So we're going to end up with option D. So a capacitor of capacitance C and a charge of Q stored on the plates. The potential difference between the plates is doubled. What is the change in the energy is stored by the capacitor? So my original expression for energy is just going to be uh, Q1 squared divided by 2C. But when we double the potential difference, we're going to double the charge. So uh, in the second instance, the charge is going to be double. And that means the energy is now going to be four times as big because Q gets squared. So then the change in energy is going to be given by 3 over 2 Q squared over C, which is this one. Okay, so a capacitor consists of two parallel square plates of side L, separated by a distance D. The capacitance of the arrangement is C. What is the capacitance when the square plates have side 2L, uh, but the separation distance is D over 2? So using this equation, if you uh, double the length, that's going to quadruple the area. And if you halve the distance, that's going to double the capacitance. So we end up with 8 times the capacitance, so we want option D. Okay, so capacitor of capacitance 120 microfarads is charged, then discharged through a 20 kilo ohm resistor. What fraction of the original charge remains on the capacitor 4.8 seconds after discharge begins? So we're going to use the charge discharge equation, and we want the fraction of the original, so we want Q over Q0. Plug our numbers in, and we end up with 0.14, which is option A. Okay, so a coil of 20 circular turns, each of diameter 60 millimetres, is placed in a uniform magnetic field of flux density 90 mini tesla, millitesla. Initially, it's perpendicular to the magnetic field, as shown in the diagram. The coil is rotated by 90 degrees in a time of 0.2 seconds, so it becomes parallel, as we can see. Assume the rate of change of flux linkage remains constant, what is the EMF inducing the coil? So the flux linkage is going to change from a maximum to zero as you rotate it 90 degrees. So if we can figure out the change in the flux linkage and divide it by the time, that calculates the rate of change of flux linkage and therefore calculates the EMF. So we've been given the flux density. We can calculate the area using pi d squared over four. We know the number of turns and we know the time. So we plug our numbers in and that gives us the EMF. So we're essentially just using Faraday's law here and we get option C. So the mean power dissipated in a resistor is 47.5 microwatt. When the RMS voltage across it is 150 millivolts, what is the peak current? So average power is uh, the RMS current times the RMS voltage and the RMS Current is the peak current divided by root 2. So we can substitute that in and then rearrange it, plug our numbers in, and we end up with option B.
So the national grid is used to transfer electric energy from power stations to consumers. What conditions for transmission voltage and transmission current give the most efficient transfer of energy? So we want really low current, and to get that, we have to have very high voltage. So that means we need option D. The mains transformer has a primary coil of 2,500 turns and a secondary coil of 130 turns. So it's a step down transformer. The primary coil has a RMS voltage of 230 volts. The secondary coil is connected to a lamp of resistance 6 ohms. The transformer is 100% efficient. What is the peak power dissipated in the lamp? So first we're going to calculate what the secondary RMS voltage is um, using the, the turns ratio. And then what we're going to do is calculate the average power on the secondary side using V squared over R. But the peak power is double the average, so we end up with 48 watts. So we are not with option C. So Rutherford scattering experiment led to the discovery of the nucleus. Very straightforward. A Geiger counter is placed near a radioactive source and different materials are placed between the source and the Geiger counter. And we've got the results. So what radiation is emitted by the source? So when there's nothing, we've got a camera rate of 1,000. When there's paper, we've still got a camera rate of 1,000. That tells us there's no alpha. Um, the count rate decreases after aluminium foil, which tells us there is some beta, but there is still some other activity. Um, but once we've got thick steel, it drops even further. So we've clearly got gamma as well. So we've got beta and gamma radiation essentially. And by the looks of it, we might even have some background, which is giving us some of that count rate. So Nobelium 259 has a half-life of 3,500 seconds. What is the decay constant of Nobelium, Nobelium 259? Uh, so we're just going to use natural log of 2 divided by half-life gives us the decay constant option B. A pure, a pure sample of nuclide X containing N nuclei has an activity A. The half-life of X is 6,000. A pure sample of nuclide Y containing 3N nuclei has an activity of 6A. What is the half-life of nuclide Y? So um, I'm going to call them A1 and A2. Uh, so the decay constant of, the, of X is just going to be A over N, which means its half-life is going to be ln 2 N over A. If we multiply the number of nuclei by 3 and multiply the activity by 6, that's going to make the overall equation divided by 2, which means we have a half-life of 3,000 years. Cobalt-60 has a half-life of 5.27 years. What is the total activity of 1 gram of cobalt-60? So first, I'm going to calculate how many molecules of cobalt-60 I've got. Then we can convert activity from that. So we need to figure out what the decay constant is. Well, it's ln 2 over the half-life. And we need the half-life in seconds because we want the activity in Becquerel, giving us option A once we plug the numbers in. The radius of a nucleus of iron nuclide of 56 Fe is 4.35 times 10 to minus 15, or 4.35 femtometers. What is the radius of the nucleus of uranium nuclide 238? So, you should know the radius is proportional to the nucleon number to the power of a third, or the cube root of nucleon number. So what I'm going to do is multiply the radius of iron by 238 over 56, all cube rooted, giving us the answer D. Final question, uranium-236 undergoes nuclear fission to produce barium-144 and krypton-89, and three free neutrons. What is the energy released in this process? So what we're going to do is calculate the energy before in MeV, the energy after in MeV, do the final minus initial, and that will tell, tell us how much energy is released. So the initial energy, we multiply the number of nucleons by the binding energy per nucleon. Afterwards, we multiply the number of nucleons by each of those binding energies per nucleon. Find the difference. It's 191 MeV. Option C, finishing this exam paper.